Hello, everybody. Now, we are going to be streaming this session live. So hello to everyone who's watching at home as well, and to all of you guys in the room. Today, we are celebrating Change Checker's 10th birthday. Woo! <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, not only are we here to mark Change Checker's massive anniversary milestone, but we're also celebrating the collecting hobby as a whole. And you know what? It really wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for each and every one of you. So whether you're watching at home or you've joined me today in the room, I wanted to say a massive thank you to all of your dedication for the collecting hobby and for your support of Change Checker. So give yourselves a massive round of applause. Now, we have got a very exciting day planned. We've met some incredible collectors so far this morning, and it's great to see so many of you have turned out this afternoon as well. But the best part is about to begin, as we're going to be treated to not just one, but three expert speakers from the Royal Mint. So we'll have David Mason from the Mint Museum. We'll then have Tommy Doherty, senior coin designer, and Paul Morgan, the King's assay master. So I'm sure you'll agree, a fantastic lineup for all of us to get an insight into the world of coins and collecting. Now, if you could all give a big round of applause as we introduce our first speaker, David Mason. Wonderful, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thank you all for being here today. I have the, the great pleasure of going first in our trio of speakers, which I always quite like because I get to offer a little bit of a grounding and a little bit of a background in what you're going to hear in this next hour and what you're already sort of seeing throughout the day as well. So my name's David, I'm here from the Royal Mint Museum. Uh, the Royal Mint, of course, has quite a lengthy history, but the museum has a history of around 200 years. We were founded in 1816. We are uh, collectors supreme. I'm sure you can all appreciate um, the enjoyment of coin collecting. Well, we collect not only coins in the museum, but also every aspect of the coin production process here at the Royal Mint. We collect items that tell the entire story of producing a coin. So the coin themselves, and then one step back, the blanks and the sometimes trial or experimental pieces as well. We collect the tools that are used to strike the coins and indeed the the earlier parts of the tools that are used to make the dies. We collect plaster models as well for three-dimensional representations of the design and all the way back to the artwork, both the artwork that is successful in coin design competitions and that which doesn't end up being moved forward as well. So there's some examples on the screen here today. I hope you can see the light is on it a little bit, but I hope you can make out some of the wonderful items in our collection. What I wanted to talk to you today about is that early stage of the process, that art and design right at the start of how something becomes a coin from an idea. And a part of that involves the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. The committee was founded in 1922. And the idea being that it would act as an independent arbiter of public taste, essentially. The decision was taken away from the senior, the deputy master at the Royal Mint and those senior figures, the responsibility was taken away to have to determine what public taste might be, what people might want on their coinage. It was thought that that might be better handled by experts, by artists, by art historians, numismatists as well. And so the Royal Mint Advisory Committee was then founded with experts from, as you might be able to make out in some of the text here, places like the Department of Coins and Medals at the British Museum, representatives from the, the V&A, representatives, or a personal representative of the King as well, who of course gets quite a significant say in the design. From the early 1950s as well, of course, the late Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, headed up the committee as president. This was a fantastic boon for the Royal Mint Advisory Committee having somebody there who had such a personal and informal link with the monarch to comment upon designs was incredibly useful. So part of our collection obviously is a great deal of coronation related material and material related to the start of the late Queen Elizabeth II's reign. And so what I'll do now is I'll take you through a little bit in our collection that relates to that and relates to some of the coin design as well. What you can see here are some designs that are taken from the minutes of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. Designs that were under consideration, both for the coinage reverses of Queen Elizabeth and for the 1953 coronation crown. Part of what we do at the Royal Mint Museum is archiving materials like this, the, uh, the minutes of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, both historically 
and present day as well. I'm quite privileged in that I not only get to look back several hundred years in my job, but I also get to look a few years forward as we fulfill those sort of administrative functions of the committee. So a little bit of a sneak peek into what's coming as well. What often eludes me is what's happening right now. You can see here some of the designs, and it's tough to make out on the screen, but also when you see them up close in person as well, um, precisely the differences between some of the designs that you see here, because that's the role of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, really. It's looking into those minute differences, not just what should be on a coin A or B, but whether a particular line and an expression changes how a face looks, whether a slight degree of rotation changes the feel of the design on the coin, changes the impression that you get of the coin. And you can see some of the text in the paragraph here, taken from those minutes, talks about how the committee deliberated whether bits of designs could be combined as well, whether perhaps we could have the, um, the orientation of the horse in Mr. Ledwood's submission number eight, and if we could perhaps have the orientation of the monarch in number nine, and could something be merged together from that? Because that is how that design process comes together, has done historically, and still to an extent does today, but I will leave the, the modern stuff to my, my uh, subsequent speakers. The portrait as well, the Mary Gillick portrait, which became the first definitive coinage portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, went through that same process at the committee. And we have in the collection a great wealth of material, of designs, of sketches, of plaster models, as minute changes were made throughout the design. When it came down to it, the competition really was between Mary Gillick and Cecil Thomas, who had quite a, a considerable advantage over Mrs. Gillick in terms of a back catalogue of coin design. And there was quite a lot of back and forth in the minutes of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, and quite a lot of back and forth in which both artists were invited to submit and resubmit sculptures and designs so that the design could be worked up into something that was just right. What you see here on the screen is one of the plaster models which features a penciled in inscription around the edge, part of that process where we have some of the design finished up and some of the design, the inscription being added on at a later date, being modified, being tweaked. It was, as you can see at the very bottom, ultimately the opinion of the committee that the final model should be, uh, well, the nose should be treated more delicately, but also that the effigy should generally be strengthened. This turned out to be one of the, uh, one of the strengths and one of the reasons we really remember the Gillick portrait of Queen Elizabeth for its delicate nature, its soft nature. It was distinct following several monarchs previous that had had quite large, looming portraits that filled the field of the coin. But it's not only the Royal Mint Advisory Committee that have opinions on coins, of course, and this is really the purpose of the committee, to act, as I said, as the arbiters of public taste. What you see here, you might be able to make out the handwriting, are some letters from the National Archives submitted in the 1950s to the Mint. People asking questions of the Mint and making requests of the coinage. There's one letter where somebody's requesting what is it, two sparrows on the farthing, which is, I think, quite ambitious on a little coin like that. Somebody is requesting, I don't know how people feel about this, the return of the Gothic crown into circulation. And someone requesting that we make the two shilling pieces hexagonal to avoid confusion with half crowns. Reasonable suggestions, but this is then the purpose of the committee to act upon some suggestions, sensible suggestions, and to make decisions that will ultimately reflect the needs of the general public and their coinage. I'll take you a little bit further back now, back to 1936 and the story of Edward VIII, which I won't dwell on too much because it's probably quite a familiar story to many collectors and many coin enthusiasts in the room, but safe to say Edward VIII was a bit of an awkward customer for the Royal Mint. Uh, as you're all now doubtless aware, the monarch in portraits on coinage faces in the opposite direction to that of their predecessor conventionally. It's a tradition that goes back about 300 years. And it's a tradition that Edward VIII was uh, not particularly happy with because he would much prefer, he did much prefer, to face left instead of right, the same way as his predecessor. Facing left would show off his good side, the parting in his hair, and what you can see here is sketches, photographs, and one of the proof pieces in gold of Edward VIII that was struck as a trial and experimental piece to show, again, that kind of progression of design and how things change. You can, you can see, perhaps on the sketch, that there are adjustments being made 
to the chin, to the hairline, to the back of the head, just to make sure that the shape is kept exactly as it should be. But the reverses too for the proposed coinage of Edward VIII are incredibly interesting. Now, of course, there never was a circulating coinage of Edward VIII in this country. His reign lasted less than a year from January 1936 through until December. But there was plenty of discussion as to whether or not there should be a change in reverses, a full change of reverses of all of the coins. And, of course, a great number of designs were proposed and went through the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. Artists designed sets of coins, artists submitted these designs. There was uh, an invitation to a number of prominent artists to submit designs. And I've shown some of them on the slide here, focusing on the crowns and the half crowns, so you can make out a little bit of the detail. Harold Wilson Parker, I quite like these designs. They, he submitted a set of designs that encompassed the values and the embodiment of the crown. So the idea was the crown piece here would demonstrate a sort of a giving tribute and making offering to the crown. The half crown here represented peace, through the dove of peace, through the olive branches, and then it goes on down the denominations with different representations of ideals of the crown. George Kruger Gray, some of those at the bottom, submitted a much more traditional set of designs, heraldic, uh, a variation on the sort of heraldry that has been seen on the coins for a very long time. Much more traditional, uh, actually ended up being favoured by the Royal Mint Advisory Committee at that time, perhaps a little bit of a backlash to the 1935 Jubilee Crown, that rocking horse, really avant-garde design, perhaps a bit of a backlash to that, moving back to the traditional. I'd have included on the right as well a design from Edmund Dulac, which I really like because it is a frighteningly literal interpretation of a seahorse. Half horse, half fish or aquatic creature of some kind. But you can see the sort of interesting designs that were considered of all different types for the proposed reverses of Edward VIII. So all of these sorts of designs and more form part of the Royal Mint Museum collection. A part of what we do is recording and telling the story of everything we've done here for hundreds of years. And will continue to do thereafter. Our original remit when being set up was to record a series of designs, record coins, record everything we do so that artists and engravers can draw from the past and bring that into the future. And on that spirit, I thought I'd finish with something a little bit more uh, well-known, a little bit more recent, which is the Kew Gardens 50p. <clears throat> there are a great many designs that went through the Royal Mint Advisory Committee for this coin. But you can see here, even on the design that really ended up being worked into the finished product, how much detail goes into changing very small things about the coin and refining the design as it goes along. The model on the left here, of course, is quite busy. There's a lot more um, foliage, there's a lot more leaves in the background. And then even as you progress towards something that is a little bit cleaner and that looks more like the final design, you can perhaps see at the bottom the change in lettering from that design through to the finished piece. The purpose then of the advisory committee is to make those very small, subtle changes to ensure that what we get on the coins is as aesthetically pleasing as possible, is as representative as it can be of British identity and culture and values. As I've said, this is but a small part of what we hold in the collection in terms of art and design. We have well, over 100,000 coins, over 40,000 pieces of tooling and plaster models that detail everything back as far as we possibly can in terms of coin design. But I hope I've been able to give you a brief overview of how the Royal Mint Advisory Committee considers designs and how we go about archiving and maintaining that process here at the museum. I'm going to hand you over to Thomas Doherty now, who is a coin designer who can tell you, uh, sorry, a sculptor who can tell you far more about present day designs than I ever could. And Thank you very much for your time and attention. Good afternoon. Well, this is uh, slightly more people than I'm ever used to talking to, so please excuse my, uh, excuse my nerves. Um, my name is Thomas Doherty. I'm a coin designer and sculptor here at the Mint, and I'm a part of the coin design team. So just to give you a bit of a kind of overview of the team, we are. A fairly sized team, we're made up of 10 members. We are split into two teams of five. One being a concept and model team, uh, which is what I'm part of. We handle everything from two-dimensional drawings to three-dimensional sculpture. Uh, and we have a technical team. 
technical team work with us. They also produce models, but they tend to take our models and then they'll work that into variants and various specifications for coins. So for Britannias or Sovereigns, they'll work the models through the various iterations of that coinage. Um, we then work underneath our head of coin design, who's Mr Paul Morgan, who will be speaking to you uh, after myself. So, to give you a, a sort of introduction to me and, and what I do in a day-to-day -day role is uh, start with some projects I've been involved with in recent years. This is the 2022 um, Prince William's 40th birthday coin. I was lucky enough to win the design competition for this, which went through the RMAC process that David has just outlined to you. Um, I then subsequently went on then and sculpted the prints uh, along with the rest of the composition. Um, 2018, the bicentenary of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein coin. I was the winning designer of that competition and also the sculptor of that too. But design only plays a small part in what I do day to day uh, and a far larger part of, of uh, a lion's share of my work is, is sculpture and low relief sculpture. Um, so here is a selection of of work that's been produced in recent years, um, which I sculpted. And the reason that we sculpt other people's designs is, is that often a designer or an artist or a, uh, a painter would be commissioned or would be with the, winning, the winner of a competition, a UK design competition, but they may not have the skills and experience necessary to produce a low relief model and especially to the types of specifications and tolerances that we require for, for coinage. So a big part of that skill and experience lies in not only being able to capture the likeness and details and textures and little points of designs, but it's also in about trying to create a sense of depth in a sculpture. So a lot of the time for things like here, um, we would usually work to around 0.15 to 0.3 millimetres in height for a model and trying to get a sense of perspective or depth into that model when you've got such a small space to work with is, uh, is really where the sort of trick in the experience um, comes in the role. So what you can see here is some pieces from Royal Tudor Beasts. We've got Harry Potter, Dumbledore, um, Mary Anning Dinosaur Collection, uh, sovereign, and I believe these are all released in recent years, um, and I was happy to, um, I'm very proud to have worked on them all. So, as you can see, through the department, through coin design as a department, we work on a large number of projects, but a, a very wide variety of subject matter, which is one of the really interesting parts of the role. Um, but one of the largest and most prestigious and uh, most important projects that's come through the department in recent years has been the change of monarch. So following the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, uh, we need a new, a new obvious in the coinage of King Charles III. Um, and it's this project that I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into today and as much as I can in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, and it will form the remainder of the talk. This is Martin Jennings. Martin Jennings is the designer and the sculptor of Charles III's effigy as used on coinage. Um, Martin works largely in three-dimensional sculpture, figurative sculpture, uh, portrait busts, as well as letter design, um, letter cutting, also in calligraphy. So this project really brings together a lot of his interests and expertise and experience into one, into one product. Um, as you can see, Martin works in traditional coinage sculpture methods, so plaster modelling, we've actually got a plaster model here of the crowned effigy, um, which you will all be able to have a look at following the talks. Uh, this is something that we as a team used to work on uh, when I first started at the Mint, so 19 years ago now. It was all traditional sculpting, so all plaster sculpting, clay sculpting. In recent years, maybe the last seven or eight years, we've moved to predominantly digital sculpting. Um, but Martin works traditionally, and part of the process is for them to, to turn this into a coin is to digitise this. What you can see in these little black dots that are placed around the effigy are a way for our laser scanning machines to denote a boundary of where they should scan. Our laser scanners can then take a number of images, collate them to make a, a digitised relief file for us to then go and work with. Um, as you will to see in the plaster model when you can look at it later on, the, 
the details and the fineness of texture and forms and, and the subtleties in the sculpt are really, you know, really impressive here. It's an amazing piece of work. Um, and it's these details, these subtleties, these textures that's massively important for us to carry through, not only to remain true to Martin's sculpture, but also to, to maintain the likeness in the effigy. Um, and also, it's how, how we look at that, not only to maintain it, but also to bolster it and enhance it so that it, it, it will carry through production methods into striking coins, especially when you're looking at circulation coinage, which will inherently take a lot more battering from being in and out of pockets and spent exchange, and how do we carry all of that through? So when we have our digital file, we can then start to work on the sculpt. Well, it's not work on the sculpt, but we can start to enha uh, enhance some of these textures and bolster some of these textures. And what we're doing is we're not, we're not adding anything in to Martin's sculpture. It's more of, a, it's more of a adjusting the contrast of those details to make them as strong as possible, but not overly strong, where it, it sort of decimates the underlying forms of the sculpt but just to give it enough clarity and enough um, longevity through the process. So here I'm working on a, on a digital sculpting package, um, really starting to understand the model, look at the heights, the proportions, and, and how, we can, how we can apply that um, to go across various coins. When I started talking about the project, I was saying of how large it was as a, as a project for us as a department. And, um, Part of that is when you change the effigy, we're looking at changing in excess of 100 products. So it's a lot of things they have to go over. And they could range from, you know, coins from 100 millimetres down to 7 millimetres. So how do you take one model? How do you treat that to get as much impact and as much statement out of that model across a wide spectrum of diameters? And not only the diameters, but what materials the coin struck in from plated steel where you have a lot lower relief to work with because it's a harder material, to gold, silver and platinum where you can really start to play with that relief height and get as much punch out of it as possible. Um, this next image then is the sort of thing that we would see then on screen. So this is when the model has been um, taken, it's been treated for heights and we've also looked to enhance those textures. So what you can see is really trying to carry as much of that through as possible. And at risk, it can look maybe ever so slightly over-egged in this image. Um, but what goes through to dies at size is really just carrying as much of this through as we can to give it to remain that lightness. And the, the texture of the plaster that you can see in the face is around the skin, that's real, really key for us to carry through as well, to really show Martin's way of working and, and the processes. And when we have the portrait and it's been mastered and it's been worked and applied to sizes, um, that's only one part of a coin's design, especially an obverse design. A large part is an inscription. Um, inscriptions can take many forms. They may have a year date, they may have a denomination. For bullion coinage, they may have uh, a weight of the coin as well as the alloy that the coin's been struck in. And the image that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen is Martin Jennings' original hand-drawn lettering for his inscription, um, which is an amazing piece of reference for us, and this is what we would work with then. So for maybe one-off coins, we could then digitise this lettering and use that, but for something that's going to be used so widespread over so many products, a big part of it for us is maintain, uh, having something that's adaptable, that can change year on year as far as year dates and denominations, and we can alter the inscriptions. So it was about picking lettering in a typeface that was sympathetic to his drawing, but that we could work with day to day. So I worked quite closely with Martin on this, um, and I supplied a whole range of, of typography and type options uh, to look at inscriptions. And this was a, this was a short list um, of what we got down to. So the image in the top left of the screen is his original drawing, and then the remaining five were the short list of typefaces. 
Now, we look at them in this kind of monotone pattern of a silhouetted effigy and the black lettering because it really helps us to identify the negative space around the lettering, around the effigy, and how you balance the weight of those two things working together. And it is really it is a balance. It's about getting something that's the right shape, um, that has the right weight and the right amount of, um, of a field, a table area around it. Martin had drawn his letters with a slight flare on the ends of them, which is kind of technically known as a glyphic serif. So I supplied them with a number of glyphic serif typefaces, uh, and we went through them. So even if you look at here, so the, the middle, the top middle uh, option compared to the top right, you can really see the difference in, in the lightness of the text on the right and how much that kind of makes the effigy look heavier. In the, in the balance of the weight there. So it's little things like that we're playing with. Also the spacing, uh, the bottom middle option takes up a lot more space as part of the ring inscription for the same size of type. So how do we make that work and how is that going to, how is that going to work in conjunction with the effigy? When we had a chosen option, which was top middle, which was the Beaufort Pro, it was then time to go and start to see how that would look across a variant of coins. So everything from a two pound, five pound, up to, I think here we've got seven, 7 thousand and 15 thousand pounds. So the eagle-eyed amongst you may spot here that there's actually two sizes of type used across these inscriptions. So the shorter inscriptions, two, five, 10 pounds, have a slightly larger typeface than the longer inscriptions of £15,000. And this is to ensure that the proportion of the space in that ring that's taken up with the inscription remains consistent across them all. So if we used only the smaller typeface, the shorter inscriptions would leave far more negative space. But if we used the larger one, you'd have to make everything so much more tighter in the lettering to make it fit. And that would then throw off this idea of negative, positive space, balance in the composition. So it's a very small change, but something that has to be considered if you really want the, the coins to look like a family, like a continuity of all verses, which we obviously did. Um, the only thing that Martin wasn't so keen in, uh, or keen on, sorry, on the typeface was the numerals. So these are the numerals for, uh, for the typeface. Um, and as you can see, the two and the three in particular are really curved at the top, at the bottom of the three. The five has a slight up kick on the top, the top line of the five. The leg of the seven flares out quite dramatically at the bottom. Um, and the O, uh, the zero, sorry, is ever so slightly narrower when compared with some of the rounder numbers like the eight and the nine. So rather than us going back and really trying to readdress the entire lettering part of the project, I suggested to Martin, well, why don't we make custom numerals to, to go in the coins, giving them you know, an additional element of, um, sort of separation from anything else and something that's a bit kind of custom and unique. He decided that he agreed that this was a, a good path to go down and then subsequently produced a drawing for me to work to. So as you can see, the top of the two has been cut off quite dramatically. The serif in the top of the one has been removed entirely and instead replaced with this little kind of glyphic flare coming off the top line. Uh, the five has removed the flare from the top but instead added it to the bottom. The seven has completely lost the kick from the bottom of the, of the upright and been made narrow. And the zero is ever so slightly wider. It's little details, but it's things like that that can really complement it when it's sitting on the coin and not overly fuss the composition. Um, and then here, in fact, if I flick back and forth quickly, I don't know if you're able to see it, but I'm pretty sure I, I produced the new numerals and the two, we actually went back and revised again because the two had been shortened too much. So we'd done it to the drawing, but then it was moved ever so slightly back out, so it was a little bit longer again. Um, and then when we had the numerals, and we had the inscriptions, and we had the lettering dialed in, and we had the effigy prepared and, and mastered for coinage. It's at this stage then that we can go and we can make laser dies. We can cut dies, which we then go on to strike coins. So what you can see here is a proof or a collector specification die. You can tell that by the, the frosted texture on the relief and on the lettering. 
and the polished table. And when we get to that stage, we can strike commemorative coins that you may want to add to your collections, through to bullion coins that you may choose to invest in, and finally onto the circulation coins that you will find in using your change every day. And that kind of gives you a 10-minute overview of quite an intense uh, project. <laughs> I kind of hope that sums it up. Um, thank you very much, and I will pass you on to the head of coin design, Mr. Paul Morgan, for the last talk. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here today, so thank you. As Thomas mentioned, uh, my name is Paul Morgan, and I head coin design at the Royal Mint as my day job. I'm fortunate, um, and that's a very fortunate position in that I get to see every stage of the manufacture of the coins. As David mentioned earlier, from the stages at RMAC and pre that stage, when we first see the concepts coming into us that will go on to make coins, they're finally born many, many months later. And also then looking through the stages of design, through the sculpting, through the making of the tools, the trials we go through, in then to production, till those coins finally sit on a shelf and get out to yourselves, which is a, a wonderful thing. And knowing, seeing so many coin collectors here, that you'll be looking at the coins in the same detail that we will. So through that process, we are the makers. And whether it's the designers, the engineers, the scientists, the craftspeople, everyone uses skill and passion to make the coins that will finally end in your hands and hopefully you see what we do. As Thomas has mentioned, the details we look into, whether we cut a serif off a letter or not, is important to us. Those, those minutia, those details that come through. And we, we hope that everyone sees these as miniature, beautiful pieces of art as we do. And we're proud of everything that, that leaves the Royal Mint. Last year was an historic year, an emotional year, an amazing year for us. Something that we saw that I didn't expect to see at my time in the Royal Mint was the changing of a monarch and the coins that were produced at, at that time. Um, First, we went to that very respectful time of the memorial series, and then the celebration of the coronation series. Uh, the one out here is, is, I think, one, one of my favorites. You don't, you look at almost, I say about coins as, as children. You never have a favorite child, but, but there's always something special that you can celebrate with, with, with any of these. So, but an absolutely brilliant uh, and wonderful series of coins. And as we produced these coins, we, we talked about how they would be received. So I'm very much hoping that you've seen these coins and, and you've enjoyed them and loved them and saw the beauty and the work that we put together for these. But there was a little bit of nerves we had as well. As we really appreciate your feedback, but we were a little worried about this man's feedback, His Majesty. But fortunately for us, us, he was pleased with these coins as well. And with a little bit of trepidation as we worked, we were so honoured that His Majesty the King saw these coins, was pleased with them, and they went into, into mass production, into circulation, into your hands as well. And in that theme, we see coin collectors, how you appreciate the coins. I was asked at this time, am I a coin collector? I thought I went, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Particularly when I was speaking to people who have so much passion about what we do. But during the year, and this is my 30th year now at the Royal Mint, working through this, I was honored enough to receive a set of Monday coins. Monday coins, I'm, I'm sure you know being collectors, but it's a series of coins that are handed out by the king on Monday, Thursday. A penny, a tuppence, a threepence, and a groat. Small silver coins. This set of small silver coins. And not magnificent by their scale, but a beautiful set. 
I received these as I left work one day, and they were opened, and I was looking at them before I got to the car park. So in that way, I do count myself as a coin collector. These, and I'm still so pleased to have received them, but still, that excitement of opening the coins, of seeing these wonderful things, sits with us as it does with you. The second thing I'd like to talk about today is the trial of the picks. Now, I know some of you would have heard of this, but I'll give a short overview to some who haven't. So this is something that all the products the Royal Mint produces, we send up. It's part of our commitment to know that an independent body will check and look at everything we do. And we're pleased that this happens. We're proud of what we manufacture and produce, and we're pleased for others to check. Why wouldn't we be? There's also a legal aspect of this, the 1971 Coinage Act. So by law, we have to have our coins independently checked. And again, we're happy. Why wouldn't we be? And this has happened since, and I have to check this date, since 1281. So, eight, 82. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Since 1282. I'm, I'm sure they were considered in 1281. But for many hundreds of years, our coins have been checked and inspected. And we're proud that they have that integrity and authenticity. So that goes to the trial of the picks. With Edward I. And you may ask, well, why did the king want the trial of the picks? We can only surmise that perhaps he didn't trust his mint in quite as much uh, as the way he should have. But at that time, a sample of the coins were taken. They were checked, and those coins, if they passed at the leopard mark, and that becomes the tradition of the Goldsmiths Company and their relationship with the Royal Mint. And if you look at the Goldsmiths Company today in London, you'll see the leopard mark still stands with them. And why picks? Well, picks comes from the Latin that means the box. There's a picks chamber in Westminster Abbey. And this small wooden box with a sample of every coin made or every denomination series of coins made would have been put into this box for verification and checking. This box would be locked, so we couldn't tamper with it. And then once a year, it would go to London and be independently checked. And that brings us to the modern trial, because where this has happened for hundreds of years, it still happens today. We still take samples of every batch of coins we produce and put them into a locked box. They still go to London. But now they're checked in much more in a much more modern way. We'll use digital calipers for checking the dimensions of the coins. We'll use digital balances to make sure the weight is accurate. And the composition will also be checked by X-ray spectrometry, as well as the traditional methods. We will still use the traditional fire assay to check. Unfortunately for us, these coins still pass. These coins still have the authenticity and the integrity that everyone can expect. So whether you're a collector of gold, precious metals and silvers, or whether you go to a parking meter and put your coin in, you still expect those coins to work. And through the work that we put in in the background, we can assure you they will. This year's Trial of the Picks was something unique um, to us. There was a change this year, a change which we saw the new effigy of King Charles III, as well as the, the image of the late queen. That was something for us, again, which was very special. It's something we hadn't seen in our time. And the trial went through with, with looking at both of these, these, these aspects. As I said, there was a part of sadness with us, but also a part of joy to see this. And something the Royal Mint has done for the last millennia is make sure as a new king comes to the throne, we change those effigies. The trial is still held as a formal legal trial with the King's Remembrancer holding the trial. And I can say with not being an expert in legal speak, as the verdict was read, I looked around the room thinking, have we passed? I saw smiles, so I know we had. And for many, many years, we've always passed. And that just shows the work that the Royal Mint puts in to make sure that we will pass this trial, to make sure you can have confidence in everything we produce. So the last thing I'd like to talk to you today is about our masterwork series of coins. And this is something we've developed really to showcase 
the craftsmanship we have here at the Royal Mint. These are a series of coins that are much larger than anything else we produce, going from 3 kilograms to 15 kilograms in weight, 165 millimetres to 220 millimetres in diameter, and made out of pure gold, three nines and above. Now, one of the challenges for us when we do this, of course, is to cut 15 kilogram coin. You start with an 18 kilogram ingot of gold. In the modern world, the health and safety aspects of moving an 18 kilogram lump of gold around comes in. And gold being such a soft material, it being 18 kilograms in weight, it starts to deform if it's not handed properly. It will start to sag and move and, and damage itself. So just with this softness and purity, we have to be very careful. But we will take the 18 kilogram ingot, and each one of these will then be cut, taking, for this piece, around 200 hours. There's then another 200 hours on top of that, with it, each one will individually be hand-worked. First to take out all the cutter marks, so one of our craftspeople will work first, with a file and then with a stone and then with some soft emery to bring this up. And then it's highly polished to a bright luster. So you see this gleaming piece of gold in front of you, which I have to say is, is magnificent when you see it. We then look at starting to add the features into this coin. Now one of the, the things we have to be very careful with this purity of gold is we don't get any imperfections or contaminations in. So it's sealed within a laser to cut the frosting on. And from that stage then, we take it to the next, where it's checked and cleaned by hand again, and signed off by three people. That's the head of manufacturing, the head of product representing the people, and myself. And until those three signatures land on that piece of paper, these coins do not leave the Royal Mint. And we're fortunate to have some pieces for you to see here today. Adding to this story as well goes our commitment of what we were doing. We wanted this as well to be a Royal Mint proposition, to be a uniquely British piece. So you see the coin here housed in a walnut box that was produced in Northern Ireland, and an acrylic which was produced in the Midlands. So as well as the craftsmanship that we put in, we looked to other British craftsmen as well to make this something unique and British, and something we were so proud to produce. And as I said, we have some examples here so you can see them up close as well. So I'm hoping you enjoy them as much as we do today. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sure you'll agree there is a lot that goes into making our UK coins. And how lucky are we that we've got an insight from the experts themselves. So give them another round of applause because that was incredible. <laughs> thank you. Now, we do have some time for a short Q&A. Before I open it up to the floor, just a reminder to everyone watching back at home, please do leave us a comment if you have a question for one of our speakers. We're going to be choosing five of you who will be lucky enough to win a goodie bag. Don't worry, you guys, you haven't missed out. You've got your goodie bags already. Now, we have some pre-prepared questions as well. So I'm going to kick things off by asking one of these, and then we'll open things up to the floor. So first off, a question from Christopher Collects himself. Many of you may know him from, from Cointubers. But he's asked if the Treasury and the banks discuss how many of each denomination of coins will be needed for the mint for circulation. And they instruct the mint to strike them. But who decides the split between the different commemorative coins? If there's a need for, say, 15 million 50Ps, does the Treasury order 5 million and then another 5 million commemoratives and definitives? Or does someone at the Royal Mint decide that split? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Steph Morris. I'm lucky enough to be the head of sales here at the Royal Mint, in case you're wondering who the random girl who's just um, jumped up at the front. So I think we can answer, that, answer this for you. Um, and the answer isn't as exciting as you might expect. So we obviously work hand in hand with the Treasury. His Majesty's Treasury is our reason for being here at the Royal Mint. So our purpose and the reason we exist is to serve His Majesty's Treasury and to make sure that we produce UK currency coinage to the King's Assay Master Standard and the passes the trial of the picks. So when it comes to putting coinage into currency, first of all, the Treasury will let us know what the demand is. 
Obviously, and the demand is different for all the denominations, two pound down to a penny. And then generally in recent years, what you will see is that we will put the coins into, um, into circulation that are relevant to what we are celebrating at the time. So the Queen's, the late Queen's Platinum Jubilee and the coronation. Um, it's really unfortunate that we don't have the, the level of demand that we have in previous years. And we would love to be able to be putting all our coins into um, into circulation, but unfortunately that's not possible. So the short answer is, it's usually a conversation between the, you know, the, the team at the Royal Mint and His Majesty's Treasury based on the demand at the time. Thank you, Steph. Do we have any questions from the audience? We've got Kate at the back, so do just raise your hand and I'll come to anyone at the front. Any questions? We've got one at the back there, Kate. Sorry, I didn't see you there. That's okay. It's for the people who design the effigies. What background do you have? Do you have like a degree in art, fine arts, creative arts, or you know what experience? Or uh, oh, uh, my background is in product design, um, but in the team, I spoke at the start of the presentation about um, the size of the team. We're t ten members, but we've all got quite varied backgrounds actually. So we have members who are come from product design backgrounds, we have illustrators, people from animation, um, crafts uh, backgrounds, and we find that, that that variety in the backgrounds and that diversity in the backgrounds of where we've kind of come from to this, to this role helps us to kind of bounce ideas off each other and, and work with um, different processes and, and different techniques. So yeah, so I personally come from product design. But yeah, but we're, but we're quite mixed, actually. There's not one kind of background in the department. We have, you know, people from all, all various things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? OK, I'll read out another one. This is from Clive Tranter. The question relates to mintage figures. And it says, do mintage figures include the coins issued in the annual sets and individual uncirculated coins, such as those purchased from distributors? Hello again. Um, so, like I said, as the head of sales, I, um, I get to oversee the sales of all coins. So, um, I'll try and explain to you, I guess, your collectors, so you are the experts. But there's two, um, two measures that we talk about. We talk about the LEP of a coin, and that is the limited edition presentation, how you buy that coin, whether it's in a leatherette box or whether it comes in a cardboard case. Um, and then the overall MCM, the maximum coin mintage. So when we talk about the maximum coin mintage, that relates to the amount of coins that the Royal Mint will issue of that coin at all, that is the definitive number, whether that goes through our distribution partners, so I'm lucky enough to work very closely with the guys down at 288 in Westminster, um, or whether those are bought directly from the Royal Mint, but the mintage figures are a total amount of coins issued from the Royal Mint, regardless of who is selling them around the world. Thank you, any more questions in the room? I've got one from the people at home. Um, so, Brian says, if you could choose any event in history or a person from history that hasn't already been commemorated on a coin, who would it be and why? Who's this one best for? <laughs> Just your opinion, I guess. <laughs> um, so, my opinion, being a Beatles purist, would be the Beatles. Um, I think it would fit lovely into our music, music legends range. Um, and um, yeah, I just think they're absolute legends. So that would be my answer. Did anyone here want to throw someone in? David, come on, there must be somebody. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the problem I have is that, of course, I, I see much of the historical coinage that we have in the museum anyway throughout the day. So I'd love to say uh, a particular monarch or figure like that. But um, I, I'm drawing a little bit of a, a blank on that. I think my interest is in that kind of that late medieval period and we get a few periods in the late medieval era where we get a bit of a swapping round of kings we get the the wars of the roses and then following on from that later on we get the english civil war we have coins of people like cromwell in the collection so for me it's less about what we're missing and more about looking at what we've done that is or what has been done in history that is interesting and unique and different i don't know if anybody has a particular figure from recent history they want to jump in with but for me i mean our collection is already very well stocked <laughs> Yeah, I think it'd be more kind of subject-based. So 
probably architecture, some sort of commemoration of our, our not commemoration, but um, celebration of architecture. I think I think uh, a country can kind of show off its progression and how modern it is or how rich historically it is through architecture and buildings. And I think that the United Kingdom has a you know a wealth of that that can be looked at from you know history and up to modern times. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that that could something that could be ce celebrated rather than commemorated on coinage would be something like that. I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to be very tight-lipped at this point um, because I've, I've seen what's coming for the next two years. Um, and, I, and what I can say is I'm overjoyed with some of the coins that are coming. Um, and we've got some real exciting themes coming out on those, those coins. And I'm going to say no more than that, but thank you. Keeping us in suspense there. Um, you know, typically we wouldn't see um, a person who's still living on a UK coin, but certainly when we've asked change checkers in the past, David Attenborough has been one of the popular choices, so you never know. Now, I know there was a question coming up the front here. You still, still got a question prep? Hopefully not too controversial. Um, the round pound coin that I still got several hundred of, when that was uh, replaced, was the, um, did you guys have any say in the design of how to avoid the, I think it's more about counterfeiting. So the original pound coin was obviously being counterfeited quite heavily because you, you came across them when you went to the bank and, uh, and, and I guess that's now gone. But is that something that you guys had input in to say, well, this will help counterfeit against fraud in future, or, or not? Were you not involved in that? Uh, yes, on behalf of the Treasury, we were heavily involved. Uh, many years before the pound was changed, we were taking coins from, from circulation, checking the levels of, of counterfeiting, uh, and working with the National Crime Agency to, to help prevent uh, that working with, with the Treasury. The one pound coin was introduced in 1983, which was a, a fantastic coin of its time. But 20, 30 years later, then yes, it did become counterfeited. There were people actively looking uh, to attack that coin. We helped design and develop, working with various um, other agencies as well, um, that new coin. The new coin you see is the most secure coin in the world. It has both visible and um, features that are only we can check for. Um, and I would say it's somewhere between, um, which we can openly talk about, between 16 and 20 security features in that pound coin. So yes, we very much looked at how the counterfeiters had operated, how they operated globally, how they looked to attack other coins, and we safeguarded the UK coins against that. We've got one from... Kevin on Facebook, or you might have to do a bit of quick maths for this one, but he says, what is the total value of coins minted at the Royal Mint every year, or approximately? Can we come back to him on that one? <laughs> have to work it out, yeah. We'll work Somebody it out. Somebody else did say, what is the oldest coin we have at the Mint? Perhaps one for David? Thank you very much. So, uh, our story really starts, and I'm sure anyone here who's, who's been around the gallery has seen it, our story really starts with the silver penny of Alfred the Great, which is not the absolute oldest coin that we have in the Royal Mint Museum collection, but it is our symbolic starting date, and it's what we like to think of as where we came from. We can date it to around 880. It's a silver penny. On one side, you've got a, uh, an image of Alfred the Great, a sort of a stylized image, because at that point we were dealing with representations of monarchy rather than exact pictures of people. And then on the other side, there's a really lovely monogram of the word Londonia, where all of the letters sort of merge into each other. Uh, it's, it's quite akin to a modern graphic design logo. You'll feel like you'd pay somebody quite a lot of money to design it these days. If you haven't seen it yet, it's actually the first coin you find in the gallery as you go around the Royal Mint experience. It's there in a case on its own. It's a wonderful piece. It stands aside from everything else as our symbolic starting date. Definitely one to look out for on your tours. Now, I have a question from Phil Breeden. He buys coins for his son, and he says, can you tell me if a tarnished coin loses its value? Would you advise taking coins out of packaging and placing them in capsules or leaving them alone? Many thanks. 
Hi, thank you. So coins, uh, especially sort of investment style coins, gold and silver, they will naturally over time develop a pattern. You see it on silver in particular where they start to darken and become a sort of a pearlescent. They have a bit of a sheen to them. Generally, sometimes this pattern increases the value, but this is something that is dependent upon the collector and whoever is interested in looking at it or buying it. But the most important thing when it comes to storing coins is just to try and make sure that you're storing them in as inert an environment as possible. So if they do develop that kind of pattern, it comes naturally and not because you've got water on them or touched them with grubby fingers or anything like that. Those sorts of things, water and oxygen in particular, will uh, corrode and, and ruin the surface and the appearance of a coin. Thank you so much. Now, we are coming to the time where the two o'clock tours will need to start getting themselves prepped. So if you are on a two o'clock tour, please could you start making your way over to the security desk. We have also been told that there are a few extra spaces on this tour. So if you're booked on a later one, say the 420, and you would like to go on an earlier tour, please go over to the ticket desk now to arrange that. I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's watching back home. And again, a thank you to our speakers. Let's give them one last round of applause. <laughs> And I'd also like to welcome you to come and have a look at these fantastic replicas and the plaster as well. If you're not on that two o'clock tour, make your way up to take a look at these because they are absolutely incredible. Thanks everyone for watching. It's been great to see you all.